we brought the, the FBI car team in and everything that they can find, there was no indication whatsoever of child abduction. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're having a great day. I want to thank you for joining me and I'm so glad to have you back. So we're going to be talking about a few things within the Summer Wells case. And there has been a lot of suspicion, as we know, on the parents. It seems highly unlikely at this point that the story did happen. As they've said, they have insisted that they believe that someone has come up and taken Summer away from the house, that they've taken her from the hill that someone lured her away. Now, something which I thought was interesting that I've seen in the news coverage, I noticed that the sheriff, Ronnie Lawson, he refers quite a few times to the neighbors, to the people that live close by within the community. And he has been insisting that those people will check their properties, that they will do a search on the properties and have a look on the land. If they have farmland, to be very careful before they go out and, for example, cut uh, anything down with the machinery, to be very careful about that, and that they would search any small structures like a shack or a barn, anything like that that they might have on their property. He has mentioned that a few times, so I'm going to play a clip for you just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. But we learned more about the person who gave the information about the truck. It was somebody driving a company truck that uh, a lot of the officers here are familiar with this gentleman, and we believe that he actually saw it. What I did ask for, and I still need, is all the people in Upper Beach Creek, in Hawkins and Sullivan County, to search their property again and again. You got to look for a small child. You have to look for evidence of a small child's being. And if you got field cameras, if you got security cameras. We need you to check those again. Just keep checking them and checking them. We're trying to find every vehicle that's in, in this holler they're living since we started this. And we also did a roadblock which helped at the same time that she was reported missing to see if we come in contact with somebody that's been working that we could see. Obviously there's nothing came out of that but it's just another tool that we've used to make this happen. So if the general public that lives in this area will go back and search their outbuildings, their barns, their hay fields, now it's mowing season, so when they mow, they need to pay attention. And if you have a resident that cannot search their property, their self, if they'll call my office at 423-272-4848, I will send an officer to your residence to search your property for you. Okay, so there he is. And so he refers to that and he has, he has that idea in his mind. And there's actually one case that I came across specifically in Rogersville. And it's also Ronnie Lawson who was in charge at that time. And I'm going to play a clip having to do with another case of a child in Rogersville, a girl who did go missing and who was then found. And I think that this might be the kind of scenario which he is referring to. So I'm going to play that now with this search from the beginning and I'll start with you Sheriff Lawson. How did they get found? What led to this? We've asked the public to kind of help join our searches and check their own properties and stuff. In this case is what had happened. They found them on, on their own property. So it... Tell me a little bit about who, who found them and what they did to keep them there until you guys got there. It was uh, Donnie Lawson and, and Stuart Franklin. They found them and they detained them until my officers got there. Okay, and is that pretty much all you can ask for when it comes for citizens to be looking out? Oh, that's it. Just, just to find them and detain them till we get there, but it's just an extension of us. You know, we've asked the public and the media for their help for the last week, and uh, it finally worked out for us. And Chief Nelson, you just got off the phone. They found the van as well, is that right? Yes, they found the van. They're processing it. They're going to have it towed to uh, 
Strawberry Plains is a TBI crime lab. They'll escort it down there. They don't want to break the chain of evidence, and they'll process it there for all the forensic stuff they're going to be doing, and they'll get back with us on that. And at this point, do you guys have any idea on a motive on why Gary Simpson would do this? No, that's, I don't have a motive right now. I'm really interested in finding that out myself, so we'll just have to wait and see on that one. Okay, so that case, it's a little bit different. She was found, and she was taken by that person who she knew, and luckily this, this child was found. Now, this makes me think that Ronnie Lawson, he may have the idea that the same thing that happened to this girl happened to Summer. With Summer, of course, it's quite different. There has been a lot of odd behavior. There are questionable habits that the parents have. There's the drinking. There's the past incidents that they've had, the other children who have been taken away. And so it brings into question the parents' capability and their responsibility. Now, as far as specifically this case, we have these parents saying that Summer was lured away from the house. We have them saying that Summer was taken from the house, that she wouldn't go away, that she wouldn't just walk off the property. And so they're not allowing for that possibility. And I don't quite understand why, because uh, if she had walked away and she could be, because that is a rural location, there are a lot of nooks and crannies, the way the landscape is there, there's a lot of trees. There's most likely areas where a child could get hurt, could fall, let's say, into a ditch, uh, a covered area. It could be, for example, as the sheriff said, let's say an outbuilding, uh, an old building where someone could get stuck under maybe some lumber, under who knows what, under an old tree, uh, maybe fall and get hurt, or, which is most likely, and they do say that usually... It is someone who the child knows, either a family member or, let's say, an, an aunt and uncle, a friend, an acquaintance, someone from, let's say, their, their community, someone who sees them, could be, let's say, someone who sees them at the shopping center when they go shopping, whatever. Someone like that uh, could have had their eyes on the family and specifically have been watching for summer. But another thing is that if this was a stranger abduction, then it would be very difficult to pull off for a stranger to come along specifically in that location, to be standing around, to be watching, to be pulling up in a vehicle, uh, let's say once a week, they're in front of Ben Hill, surrounding that area, circling the area, stopping, getting out, creeping up towards the property, coming from the, from the back. As they say, there's a dog path, which we were shown that Don Wells did show that he could get through from the top of the hill. He actually was able to walk down to the road. But still, I think that it would be very difficult for a stranger who doesn't know that location to actually do that and to pull it off. And that is what's, that's something which we all kind of agree upon, that um, for a stranger to do that, to have, for example, an idea of the schedule that they keep, you know, the ins and outs, knowing who's there, knowing who might possibly be at the house and knowing when they leave, having that awareness of knowing that, for example, the father's not there during the day, uh, knowing specifically that that day would be safe to come and take summer, that kind of stuff. And so for a person, for a stranger to become familiar with not only that neighborhood, to know that there's nobody watching, that neighbors aren't watching, you know, how is a person going to stalk that area when we find out that, for example, Jody Sue, she heard a scream, and so she was in her own house, but she could hear a scream. We were kind of hyper alert um, because of property things that had happened the day before, so we were listening for noise, everything was kind of quiet. The sale brought a plethora of people to their door, confused about which piece of land was for sale, leading to a dispute of property lines. While we were out at one point doing survey lines, and there was a flash of a car that went up Candace and Donnie's driveway, something about it struck me wrong. She and her family next heard a truck door slamming and dismissed it as their neighbors. The next sound was harder to justify. About an hour and a half before Summer is thought to go missing, Jody Sue, her son, and her daughter heard something far more suspicious, a scream. Stopped all three of us cold. Her daughter was the first to go to the cabin door. Then all three were there listening still. We heard just this kind of shrill, almost 
animalistic scream. Animalistic, but not an animal. I knew it was, you know, wrong. It wasn't a dog, it wasn't an animal. That vigilance kicking into overdrive. Jody Sue and her son went out to look for the source of the scream. My son and I decided to go out and look and see what we could see. We went back onto the bank, didn't see anything, didn't hear anything. They went on with their evening. The kids returned to being kids. Jody Sue headed down her driveway around six to ten to flowers. And at this point, I start hearing Candace hollering for summer. And then my brain immediately went, you know, scream earlier, this, uh-oh. And so a stranger abduction, that would require a person to be aware that they actually are safe, that there's nobody watching, that nobody can hear them. And so that is the thing that makes it very difficult to pull off. And what we do find in other abduction cases, you find that a lot of the times there will be someone who will be a witness, who will see something, who will see that somebody has rushed off, they might see that their friend has been taken. Oftentimes these things happen. It could be, let's say, outside of a, a school or let's say further away from a school or on the sidewalk or like in broad daylight that somebody will drive up and that is how it can happen. I've heard of a case where uh, there was this person, the criminal, who had dressed up kind of in a police outfit or a security outfit and they approached the younger child, and the child being innocent, not suspecting anything, let that person get close. And so that was, that was the dangerous thing, that they had to walk to school, and that is, that is when it happened, the abduction happened. But then later, they had interviewed different people who also went to the school, uh, people that were uh, within that route, which the child would have walked, and the investigator was able to also uh, check in and look on that area. And they found out that this, uh, this character had been there before and that the person had been, the criminal had been dressed up in that outfit and somebody else had spotted them. And they then reported that. And so then the officers had something to look for. It was kind of a clue. And they were then able to zoom in on and focus on that perpetrator, you know, and to see, you know, who is this guy? He's creepy. He's doing this. Uh, here he is. And then after that, they found uh, the child's coat uh, on their property. And so that is accounts told by real people who lived in the area. And in that case, it was more of a city location where there was lots of houses close by and there was more people to have to interview. But here, there aren't too many neighbors, and we see, basically we see a lot of hills, we see a lot of trees, and the houses are quite far apart. So that also would make it more difficult for uh, a creep or an abductor to, to kind of just blend in. You know, it's harder to blend in when you are just standing amongst, let's say, a country road, and there's houses in the distance which can see that your vehicle is there parked, they can hear you coming up. It's kind of difficult to blend in. Whereas when you're in a city and you have lots of people around, you can kind of stand around without being noticed as much when there's lots of activity happening. And so that is a thing which makes it more difficult when you consider the location of Ben Hill Road. Now, back to that whole thing with Ronnie Lawson. I thought it was really interesting because he kept on insisting on that idea that he wanted people to check their properties. And he even said that if there are people that can't do that for themselves, that he will actually send out a police officer to assist to search their properties. And so he's, he's kind of stuck on that idea. I guess it could be because of the previous case that did have an, a good outcome. I wonder if that's why. Now, I have heard that people wouldn't want to have to have the officers come up to their property because they say that there is, and I'm not going to cover everyone over with like a negative um, comment, but that there has been some mention of um, some illegal um, goings on basically in that location. And so for that reason, they wouldn't want to invite the law to invite an officer onto their property because uh, that would maybe um, get them 
into trouble. So not for the reason that they're hiding, for example, summer, but for the reason that they don't want to um, let their own wheelings and dealings out for law enforcement to question. Now, I was reading about some other cases having to do with kidnappings, child abduction in the United States, and they say that it continues to reach astronomical high numbers, even with advanced technology to help solve cold cases in unsolved kidnappings. There is still a pressing need for collaboration between the U.S. government agencies and crime analysis experts to join forces and uncover the truth behind these unsolved crimes. Now, this is going back a couple of years, but according to the FBI's National Crime Enforcement Center, the NCIC, there were a total of 87,500 active records of missing or unidentified persons in 2019 in the United States alone. Out of these 87,500 active records, 35% were for juveniles under 18, and 44% were for missing persons between 19 and 21 years of age. So that is quite a bit older than summer, but it shows you the span there. And they say whether you study forensic anthropology or are an expert, detective, all forensic specialists can help solve cold cases, such as these categorized in kidnappings. Now, of course, all of these cases are different and it depends on where it happens. Now, I came across an interesting case. It has a little bit of a twist, but I just wanted to mention it here for you guys. And this is the case of Paul Joseph Fronzak. This happened way back in 1964, but this is a kidnapping case. And it was a case of a day old baby and it happened in Chicago. Like I said, in a hospital, this case ended with good news. At first, he was found two years later in a stroller and he was returned to his parents. At least it seemed that way for more than 40 years. Franzak, who is now 56, took a DNA test in 2012 and urged his parents to do the same. The results showed Paul was not related to his parents at all. A DNA technician told him point blank that there was no remote way he was their child. Franzak was left wondering exactly who he is and the FBI, which initially headed the case, reopened it. So isn't that, isn't that kind of crazy? Uh, you have this child who's been taken, and um, I'm wondering about the parents who had him for two years from that uh, stroller. So it goes on to say that it wasn't until April of 2019 that the real Paul Fronzak, whose name was Kevin Beatty, was discovered when Beatty's daughter submitted a DNA sample to a genealogy website. The DNA test results showed a link between Kevin Beatty and Paul Fronzak's parents, Chester and Dora Fronzak. Paul Fronzak reached out to Kevin Beatty, but reportedly has had little communication with him. Before his death from cancer on April 25th of 2020, which was also his actual birth date, Kevin Beatty reportedly spoke several times with his birth mother, Dora. His biological father, Chester, died in 2017. The kidnapper, a woman dressed as a nurse in 1964, remains unidentified, but could be Lorraine Fountain, who raised Kevin Beatty in Wexford County, Michigan, who died in 2004. Paul Fronzak wrote an autobiography about his mysterious upbringing, The Foundling, and lives in Nevada with his daughter. So that is a very odd and very interesting case and that is way before we had any of this technology before dna before all these things but luckily they were able to to use eventually they were able to get in on that technology and to have his dna sampled all right so there's another case here that i came across and again this one here is another abduction and it doesn't happen at the person's house just like the one i just talked about that happened at a hospital this one here happens when this girl, Janice Pocket, this one happened in July of 1973. Now, in this case, Janice had been riding her bike and she never came back. According to Current, her older sister recalled going out with her mom and calling her sister's name over and over. Her bike was found less than a mile from her home and a Connecticut police official commented 
that she must have been snatched on the way back. The Connecticut State Police initially investigated the case, which has been reopened repeatedly and remains the lead agency on the crime. Janice's story has been featured on Discovery Network, and there was a Facebook page for her as well. Now, there's another case here, the case of Angela Hammond. She was 20 and was four months pregnant when she disappeared from Clinton, Missouri. This was in April of 1991. According to the website Unsolved, she was last said to be talking on a payphone to her boyfriend outside a grocery store at about 11.45 p.m. The details indicate that she told her boyfriend a pickup truck pulled into the parking lot with a grimy looking white man inside. Not much later, Angela's boyfriend heard her scream, so he rushed to the store, reportedly passing a pickup truck on his way. He heard someone yell, Robbie, out of the window, and he turned around to follow the truck, but his transmission died two miles later. Okay, that is really bad luck. Now, that was the last anyone saw the girl that went by Angie, and the case has never been solved. The Angela Hammond Facebook page is devoted to her, and the Clinton Police Department is available to take any new details. So there we have another case where uh, this one here, she's older, she's 20, but, you know, this is an abduction, and this happened at a grocery store. And that's being back in 1991, so of course back then we didn't have cell phones, we were using pay phones at that time. Now, I did come across another one here that I want to tell you guys about. This is a case out of Strasburg, Virginia, and it's the case of Allison Dalton. And she was just a baby when she disappeared from her mother's apartment. But detectives are not giving up hope. In July of 2017, the Virginia State Police Department issued a press release along with a photo composite of the infant that went missing, saying it is still looking for Lee's in her case. So much gruesome information is already known about the case, just not what happened to the baby. Allison's mother, Selena Jo Dalton, then 20, was found stabbed to death in the apartment that she shared with Allison and her mother. In 2001, Selena's mother filed a wrongful death suit against Allison's former boyfriend, Daniel E. Pompey, who she said was the child's father and responsible for kidnapping Allison, according to the website Let's Find Them. The Connecticut State Police say that Pompey has not been exonerated as a suspect and continues to work with the Strasbourg Police Department to seek clues and new information. So that is a very dreadful case as well, with the mother being killed and the baby being taken. That is also quite a bit different from the case that we're looking at now with Summer Wells. Now here we have another case that happened in Minnesota. This is the case of Jacob Wetterling. In October of 1989, Jacob was abducted by a masked man at gunpoint in St. Joseph, Minnesota. Jacob was riding his bike with his brother and a friend, and the other two boys were told to run or be shot. The masked gunman, who was identified 30 years later as Danny Heinrich, admitted in court in 2016 that he abducted and essayed and killed Jacob Wetterling. Fearing the police would hear his cries after being assaulted, he shot Jacob Wetterling twice and buried his body on his farm. Danny Heinrich's DNA was found on the sweatshirt of the 12-year-old boy, who was Jared Sherrill, and I hope I said that correctly, it's J-E-R-E-D, and the last name is S-C-H-E-I-E-R-L, and he was 12. He was snatched and essayed nine months before Jacob Wetterling. Local resident and blogger Joy Baker worked with Jared to investigate the connection between the two crimes and proved answers for the Wetterling family. So that there um, brings another thing, another possibility, which would be this kind of person who is a predator. And that is what happened in this case. You have an essay predator who is attacking children and has then finally been caught. And so there are, uh, they have spoken in the Summerwells case about how many essay perpetrators that are actually listed within that vicinity. And it was quite a few, I think it was upwards of 40 uh, within that vicinity where they live. Another case that I came across is the case of Danny Goldman, who was missing since 1966 out of Miami-Dade, Florida, 
was investigated by two agencies and then Dade County Sheriff's Office and the FBI, according to Miami Herald. Danny was kidnapped from his home in March of 1966, the day he turned 18. The kidnapper could not find the $10,000 in the home he demanded, so he abducted Danny instead, saying he wanted $25,000 that evening in ransom. The kidnapper never called and Danny was never seen again. That is a strange thing about these kidnapping cases that sometimes they never do actually call back. And that can be because they realize they're going to be caught, so they kind of have to just abort the mission. But um, that is what they're saying that happened in this case. The case was reopened in 2012 when investigators went to interview Danny's former ex-girlfriend, a high school classmate of Danny's, also an attorney, launched the website surfsidekidnapping.org to keep interest in the case active. There's another case here of Kim Sue Leggett. In 2012, the FBI released aerial photos related to the disappearance of Kim to KGRV.com, a Rio Grande Valley, Texas news station. The Monitor reports that in 1994, Leggett, a then 21-year-old wife and mother, was abducted from her place of work at a Texas cotton gin. Soon after that, her father received a ransom phone call and a ransom note a few days later, but that was the last they heard. The ransom note appeared to be written in Kim's handwriting and asking for $250,000. The investigation was handled by the Mercedes Police Department and may have been botched, but not deliberately. An investigator has told KGRV believing Kim may be dead. The Texas Department of Public Safety placed her on its Top 12 Texas Rangers Unsolved Homicides webpage in 2013. The FBI and Hidalgo County continue to seek information related to the case. So that is quite an odd circumstance there, and it's a big amount of money, the $250,000. And so that would, that would be something which we don't see in the Summer Wells case. That's not... That's not part of this case. Nobody has asked for money, for ransom money. Now, as far as we know, unless there are some wheelings and dealings going behind the scene, you know, debts maybe. People have mentioned that, the possibility of debts that had to be paid. Now, another case that I came across, this one here happened in Michigan. It's the case of Brittany Beers, and it made news in 2012, but not in a way anyone would ever hope for. In September of 2012. That marked 15 years since the 16-year-old went missing outside of her apartment complex in Sturgis, Michigan. According to the Sturgis Journal, she was last seen sitting on a bench at about 8.45 p.m. outside of her family's apartment complex. Witnesses indicated that Brittany was talking to a man. A red or brown car was described as a vehicle of suspicion in the 1997 crime. A detective with the Sturgis Police Department most recently told WSWB that the girl was probably no longer alive, but that there was always hope the case remained open as of 2012, with the Sturgis Police Department receiving and following up on more than 1,000 tips over the years. Then, later, in 2015, Daniel Furlong admitted to essaying and strangling dumping the body and bicycle of Jody Parak in 2007 in a cemetery in Constantine, Michigan, where her mother found her. He was labeled as a person of interest in the Brittany Beers case after DNA from Barrack's body and clothing matched the DNA swabbed from a 10-year-old girl he abducted in White Pigeon, who broke free after being tied up with extension cords at knife point. As a part of a plea deal for these crimes in 2016, Daniel Furlong agreed to take a polygraph test about the Beers case in which he said he did not kill Brittany Beers. The Sturgis police are not done questioning him, but he can't be forced to take a second polygraph test. At 65 years old, Daniel Furlong was sentenced to 30 to 60 years in prison for second-degree murder charges. Okay, so this is the kind of creep that goes around doing all these sorts of crazy crimes and nobody is safe when someone like that is around. That is a horrible case. So that kind of remains unsolved. 
Now there's another case that had been on Unsolved Mysteries. And this is the case of a five-month-old that was actually taken from her crib. I believe this one here happened in Florida, in Valrico, Florida. This girl was five months old and she disappeared in November of 1997 from her crib right around Thanksgiving time. The garage was found open and the house door unlocked and there was no sign of an intrusion. The parents were considered top suspects by the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, which received a warrant to bug their home, according to ABC News and 2020. The FBI indicted the couple, but a federal judge declared the information obtained from the bug in the home was inaudible and therefore inadmissible. The couple has also taken polygraphs, but they turned out to be inconclusive. Then, years later in 2003, a girl in Illinois was thought to be this baby girl, the five-month-old child, but DNA proved otherwise. The Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office continues to investigate, and till this point, the five-month-old has never been found. This is from a news article called Forensics Colleagues, and I'm going to put a link in for you so that you can refer to it to get all the details, and it shows us that there's so many different uh, circumstances that do happen in these cases. And here we have a case where there is no proof, there hasn't been a trail, and it is the very strange part about the Summerwells case. They're saying that it's an abduction, but there has been not even a shred of evidence. Not any fingerprints, not a footprint, not a sighting of a vehicle, nothing at this point. There hasn't been, as far as we know, there has been no tip called in, which has put suspicion onto someone else, but there has been a lot of talk. Every person has come out, and that's including neighbors and friends, but to this point, there is no real evidence that we know of. We do keep going back to the suspicious activities, the behavior. People talk about Summer, the time we see her dancing in front of the red barrel, which has stamped on it or painted on it. It says for sale, and people have made a lot of uh, speculation upon that saying that it's possible that it has something to do or that it's linked with trafficking. And there was another comment that I received from someone who said that on Facebook, uh, there's a lot of connections to trafficking, that there are friends, Facebook friends of the family that had some odd posts that were put up and that would lend more speculation on to the whole trafficking idea. They believe that it was quite odd to have summer dancing in front of that for sale barrel. Later, the barrel was removed. So that is, um, that is something which we don't have proof for, but there's a lot of people who do see that as a major red flag. So I'm going to play a couple of news clips that I have pulled that I thought were kind of interesting. And uh, let me know what you guys think about that. I'm going to play those in just a second, but I want to thank you first for joining me. And just leave your comments below after watching the clips. And let me know what you think. If anything stands out to you in these other cases that I've mentioned, we can see that oftentimes there is either an eyewitness who has seen something or there's a shred of evidence that is eventually found. And so um, in some of these cases, luckily the person will be found alive. As for example, the case that I showed you there, that girl who was also in Rogersville, but that was years ago. Now, I guess there's still hope. You know, having that as an example, there is hope. So let me know what you guys think about that. It is good to see that it is a possibility. And um, I guess we can still hope and pray. Just hope and pray that Summer can be found and that she is safe. If it was a kind of an abduction scenario, then, um, you know, maybe she can still be found safe. And that would be a best case scenario. So let me just play these clips for you. We brought the, the FBI car team in and everything that they can find, there was no indication whatsoever of child abduction. I assure you, we've done everything. When we was up on that scene, everything humanly possible to do. It's been months since the weeks-long ground search for Summer Wells was called off in the Beach Creek community. The manpower, the search, 
the helicopters, the airplanes, tremendous amount of, of dogs, cadaver dogs, search dogs, search and rescue teams. Now, the Hawkins County Sheriff's Office, TBI, and FBI are still following up on tips. I have one detective assigned to it, and TBI has agents assigned to it as well. We have the FBI partners on board. My detective, when he gets things comes in that he needs to look at, then he will get other detectives to help him follow up those leads. Summer's parents and concerned community members believe she may have been abducted or trafficked. I assure you we've done everything when we was up on that scene, everything humanly possible to do. The FBI's child abduction rapid deployment team even came to Beach Creek. That's a team dedicated to investigative, technical, analytical, and resource assistance on site during non-family child abductions, ransom child abductions, and mysterious disappearances of children. We brought the, the FBI car team in and everything that they can find, there was no indication whatsoever of child abduction. The TBI asked for help finding the driver of a Toyota pickup truck that was seen in the area around the time Summer went missing. That's the last new public information that was released. You would think if somebody had saw something, they would come forward, even if they just had the truck and didn't see anything. But like I said before, it may be somebody that has paid no attention to this, or maybe somebody that's got a criminal record and was driving what's supposed to be driving too. Months later, that truck and its driver haven't been identified, but we learned more about the person who gave the information about the truck. It was somebody driving a company truck that uh, a lot of officers here are familiar with this gentleman, and we believe that he actually saw it. Almost five months, more than 1,500 tips, and a massive ground search later, the question of where Summer Wells is still remains. Nothing pointing to abduction, nothing pointing to foul play, other than her walking out outside the house and, and not being found is basically the main thing right now. And what actually happened to her, we're still trying to find out. We would rather not do these things at all. We'd rather our, just, our life to go back to normal, and we just wish Summer could come home. It's brought up a lot of emotion, very emotional, running around on that beach just having a awesome time and we and here we are alone well it seems like alone when you ain't got your kids when you've had them all these all this time and then all of a sudden you don't have them. the media not only in upper east tennessee but middle tennessee and fox news and everybody else contact me in my office with information about this have you ever encountered anything like this in your career I'm talking about missing child to this magnitude no no it's I've been through a lot in the last 44 years, seen a lot, investigated a lot, but this is one of the top ones. The magnitude also spreading to social media and content creation on YouTube, oftentimes allowing rumors to spread. The majority of it's been a hindrance because a lot of the information that we get is the same information that we've went over time after time after time. We really don't pay a whole lot of attention to social media because it has really nothing to do with this case because, like I said, 99% of it's false. I realize Summer is somewhere that she's probably doesn't want to be, probably locked up or being, you know, hurt in some way. And when we're there on that beautiful beach and our daughter is who knows. There's still two aspects of this case, the active search and the investigation. You'll hear more about the search in just a minute. TBI agents and Hawkins County detectives working alongside the FBI continue to work around the clock to determine what happened to Summer Wells. In order to preserve the integrity of the investigation, we can't discuss everything we're doing and have done to find Summer. Here's what we can tell you. Numerous residents and individuals associated with the family have been interviewed. Surveillance video and photos have been reviewed as well as other potential digital evidence. We're still working to identify everyone in the area on the afternoon that Summer went missing. One of you asked us in a previous briefing the standard amount of time it takes for a case like this to be resolved. While every case is different, this one is definitely outside of the norm. Typically, in an investigation like this one, we have some idea of where the case is headed and what might have happened within a few days. In this situation, Despite doing everything within our power 
and exploring all avenues, the circumstances leading to Summer's disappearance remain unclear. I understand the lack of answers frustrates you in the public, but trust me, no one is more frustrated than we are. If we develop information that will lead to locating Summer, we will share that with you first thing, first and foremost. In the meantime, we ask anyone with information who hasn't come forward to please call 1-800-TBI-FIND. I'll turn it over to Sheriff Ronnie Lawson. Thank you. Just to go along with Leslie, I know there's a lot of social media going on out there, a lot of detectives going on, but they're absolutely useless unless these people that's 100% positive calls 1-800-TBI-FIND. That means nothing. We're monitoring all social media and everything that you all put out from people that you all interview. And I assure you, you'd have to work very hard to find somebody that we hadn't talked to. They may not tell you. One point I want to make and clear up, obviously, is a couple of days ago, I asked for the public not to help us in our search on, in the woods and stuff. That is because we know where every searcher is, where every team is, and the captain and his staff, they're tracking everyone. So if we get the general public in the woods, we don't know about it, then they're going to miss, get missed when they go home or don't go home. So it's going to be somebody else that we have to generate time and information and resources to find. What I did ask for and I still need is all the people in Upper Beach Creek and Hawkins and Sullivan County to search their property again and again. You got to look for a small child. You have to look for evidence of a small child's being. And if you got field cameras, if you got security cameras, we need you to check those again. Just keep checking them and checking them. We're trying to find every vehicle that's in, in this holler they're living since we started this. And we also did a roadblock which helped at the same time that she was reported missing to see if we come in contact with somebody that's been working that we could see. Obviously, there's nothing came out of that, but it's just another tool that we've used to make this happen. So if the general public that lives in this area will go back and search their outbuildings, their barns, their hay fields, now it's mowing season, so when they mow, they need to pay attention. And if you have a resident that cannot search their property their self if they'll call my office at 423-272-4848 i will send an officer to your residence to search your property for you it's a cooperation that we must need because i know some of the residents are probably getting frustrated with seeing the officers but as the captain will tell you we've had very intense uh, operations all week long for nine days now and we're not done yet because like i told you from day one it's about finding summer. That's the number one goal here. Yep. So when her mother come in, she says, well, summer, she went down in the basement. She didn't answer, so she went down there and she was gone. So she went out the basement door, which was unlocked, and we haven't seen her since. This morning, Donald Wells spoke on camera for the first time since his daughter disappeared. Please let summer be okay. He says it's unlikely Summer would leave the house on her own. Wells says the last time anyone in the family saw Summer was when she entered the house to play in the basement after gardening with her mother and grandmother. Wells also spoke about his gut feeling about Summer's whereabouts. Some bad person grabbed her, but we have no idea. Wells says law enforcement have covered leads on area sex offenders and drug addicts. We're trying to think, beat her brains out. Covered everything that we can think of already. Investigators say they have followed up on 85 tips so far. Wells says he is overwhelmed by the massive numbers of personnel on site. We just really appreciate everybody trying to help. That they have law enforcement and all, all these volunteers that are here. I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. My patrol division, that's the officers goes out and answers the calls and stuff, and my school resource officers, just those two groups alone. They accumulated over 3,200 hours. 
That's not counting the rest of the division. The surge also highlighted issues with the communication system in the county and depleted funds and resources from other agencies, including rescue squads and those that are volunteer based. It's going to cost a lot of money. Um, and the thing is, is that if, it, if it's going to cost this amount of money, we just have to figure out how to resource the sheriff's department. It's not a matter of, you know, it's going to cost this much money, so we can't, we can't continue the search. That's not, that's not part of the conversation at all. Uh, this conversation is more about how can we resource the, the, our first responders to be able to do the job we paid them to do. Hawkins County is heading into this fiscal year on a $2 million deficit and plans to make up the money from their reserve fund. While money can be moved around, Commissioner Hannah Weiniger wonders what other costs the counties could have if funding had to be cut back for those agencies. If these rescue organizations fold in the county, I mean, we have to have these organizations. We have to have these type of things. So. If they fold, what does that look like and what would that cost the county to, to pay, you know, county employees to do these kind of services? A lot. I know she didn't walk away from this property by herself or off this yard by her swing. I feel in my heart that somebody has came up here and took her, has lured her away from here. Me and my mother and her were planting flowers and we went in after we got done washing our hands and she got a piece of candy from grandma and she wanted to go back over and see her brothers and I said okay and I walked her all the way over to the porch and I watched her walk into the kitchen where the boys were watching TV and I told the boys, I said, watch summer, I'll be back. And within two minutes, I came back and I asked the boys where their sister was. And they said, she went downstairs, mom, to play with her toys in the playroom. I said, OK. And I yelled downstairs for her a couple times and I didn't get no answer, which was unusual because usually she always answers me. And so I went down there to check and she was nowhere in sight. She was just gone. I don't go on walks around here or runs because I'm scared of the bears and snakes and even the coyotes that are around here. Well, whoever has my daughter, I pray and hope that they have not harmed her and they bring her back to us safe and sound. And just turn, I mean, go to the FBI, the police and uh, clear it up. I mean, I don't know, it seems kind of elusive. It's really strange that I've never seen this truck, and I've never heard of it until just recently. But I wish they would come forward and explain themselves. And if you're not a suspect, at least come forward and say what you've seen. She was a tomboy. I shaved my head. She wanted to have her head shaved like me and the boys did. She tried to shave her head she tried in to the back and, and make it... Uh, I think you can see it in some of the pictures, and it was getting out of control. So she, we decided to shave her head off and let it grow back long. And she shaved her head to, to so she wouldn't feel bad. And uh, but, but it didn't bother her at this point. Well, we knew I knew right away that she was abducted. You know, I knew that right away, and that's what I told them from the beginning. But they have to, they have to go through their, you know, I forget the word. Investigation. They have to do one step at a time, I guess. But I'm sorry that they had to spend so many man hours in these woods and everything. I've seen them limping and everything else, you know, and I feel for them. But I just wish there was a way that neighbors could search neighbors' houses and then if they're not willing, you know, get a search warrant or something, but th there's just no way you can search every single house, you know, in the eastern United States or whatever. But I wish there was a way. Just thankful for the person or persons that's doing that, you know, out of love, and trying, trying to get information and trying to get her found. And I, we thank them from the bottom of our hearts. That means a lot. And we thank uh, everybody who's trying so hard and praying so hard. And she's an awesome young lady, and uh, we just want her back. But, yeah. 
Yeah, there's always going to be haters, you know, and you know it's always going to be that way in this world, and we just want to focus on the the good friends and Christian people that are trying to help us and praying for us and praying for summer. And we thank them from the bottom of our hearts, and that's the, the kind of people we try to relate with and socialize with. So we don't know anything about, you know, no red truck, or we hardly know many of our neighbors. I mean, because we just try to be around good people. I mean, and we do have good people in this area. We found out since this has all happened, uh, we got some real good neighbors and good folks everywhere. But. Uh, the most important thing is to bring Summer home safe. I'm sorry that you feel this way about us, but we love our children with everything we have. We've never went without, thanks to Summer's daddy and my husband. He's always provided for us and has worked as much as he could and can and still is. And I'm sorry that you guys feel that way, but that's my baby, and nobody would ever treat her like that as long as I was around, ever. She loves to, she loves to dance. She, she would always want me. She says, "Daddy, hold my hand so I can twirl," and she would, she would just like to twirl and twirl and twirl until my arm got tired. <laughs> You know, but, and you know, I, I put out there that one of, Can uh, one of Summer's favorite songs was uh, Godzilla, and they say, you know, and they're jumping all over me about past tense, was, you know, well, I'm sorry about that. It's just, she also liked the song um, by a new yeah. breed. It was called House, yeah. My House. She yeah. sung that a lot of times when I play it on the TV. She loved to dance. She liked to think of herself as a princess, and uh, you know, and all that, like all young girls do. And, uh, she loved Frozen. She loved to be that Elsa, and I think she really loved to be in church because she felt a lot of love there, and I think. It's, you can't explain what that love is, but you feel it and you know it, you know, when you're young. And she felt that there and, and she loved everybody in that church. Or she loves everybody in that church. I should rephrase that because they'll tear that apart as past tense. And I apologize again for that. I hope she gets to come home, you know, and I hope she gets to be with our church family again. Our best friend in that yeah. church was Robin. She loved yeah, her to death. Yeah, she looked up to when women she, that were. She come to that church. She went looking for Robin. That was her favorite person. Any woman that uh, was professional, that was pretty, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, she looked up to those kind of women. She, you know, they were. Uh, how do you, the word I'm looking for? I can't think of it. But she looked up to them. The money every day. She'd give them a run for their money. And there was times, you know, we'd, we'd be, you know, at our boys, like, don't do this and don't do that. And next thing you know, the stick would come up and just whop them, you know, and it'd be like, Summer, don't do that. You Summer know? was the boss of the family. Yeah, she's she, typical girl. When they get out of line, she'd put them in line. She'd do her best. She loved to play in the mud and the water and swing on her swing and enjoy dirt. When I was when I run the lawnmower around, she she would run behind me. When the boys run their bikes around, she as fast as that little bike could go, she would be behind them running and keeping up with them, no problem. You know, she loved to run. She just loved to run, and uh, she could pull herself up on that swing, her full body weight with her two hands, and she could do that. Nobody, none of the other boys could do that, but she can. Was she in school yet? No, no, she's going this year. This was supposed to be her first year. She's of been. Uh, we did all the what? I took care of everything. Yeah. She, I had her, already took on all of her shots and registered in the school for ready for this year. Yeah. I just never expected 
for anyone to get a hold of my heart like she has, because I try to guard my heart as much as I can, but she just, she's, she holds my heart in her little hands. And I love her with all my heart. I mean, I'd do anything to have her back. If there's any way, if you can find it in your heart to please release her somehow, I don't know how you might do that. I mean, cause I'm, you're probably scared of going to prison for the rest of your life and everything else, I'm sure. But please find it in your heart, have mercy, and find a way of letting her go and, and where we can get her back. And uh, just please have mercy on her and, you know, and us and her, her brothers. And she's such a loving, good spirit. Please, please don't hurt her. Please let her come home. That she's, my biggest fear is you know, her being tormented or locked in a, a dungeon or basement or something, because she loves she loved to be outside all the time. And that's that was her. Unfortunately, her you know her downfall. Because a lot of times we, the boys would be inside and we'd be like, "Where's Summer? Why'd you leave her out there alone?" You know, go get Summer now. You know, and that's happened over and over again. And uh, we'd come out and she would always be close by, but. We was always coming up. She had to be outside. She was an outdoor person. And she she loved to be outside. Yep. You know, and I just, I'm so afraid that she's locked away. She's such a loving heart and everything. And I'm afraid that she won't be able to, you know, I'm locked away where she can't be outside or play with a puppy or anything. Love nature, you know. You know, and it just, it's, that's my greatest fear that she's not able to do any of these things anymore or, or that she could possibly, you know, I, I, I don't want to think she's dead, but it's a possibility. I don't want to address all the negativity. I just want to focus on the positive because it's so easy to get, you know, lost in that negativity and stuff and it's just not worth it. So I'm just, uh, I appreciate y'all, the, the good things you say and, uh, and your prayers. That's awesome. When my sister came missing, I was in between you. Arkansas and Tennessee. I don't know all of what happened or what did happen, but I hope that they find her too and bring her home safely too. Well, yeah, there's no, there's nothing. That, I mean, she disappeared without a trace. They haven't found anything, haven't found a body, nothing. and. And you know, when you see cases like that, that's why I lose hope on summer. You know, I want to keep hope, but sometimes I just, I, I, I just, I lose hope. Lose it. And I think, well, maybe we won't never see her again. You know, or, so I start thinking in past tense. Sorry, but I'm trying to keep hope up. I'm trying to keep my prayers up and all that. On October 14th of 2020, the Hawkins County Sheriff's Office was dispatched to the Wells home on Ben Hill Road for a domestic assault situation. Well, I told officers that Donald Wells came home drunk and saw someone else in the house and believed that Bly was cheating on him. Wells allegedly argued with the person and pushed Bly down, injuring her left knee. Wells was arrested and charged with domestic assault, possession of a handgun while under the influence and unlawful possession of a weapon. Bly filed an order of protection against Wells the following day, writing, quote, I am afraid of being hurt. He is abusive physically and mentally toward me. I am afraid for my children and myself. Four days later, on the date of the hearing, Bly asked for those charges to be dismissed. On April 21st of 2021, Wells pled guilty to possession of a handgun while under the influence and turned the weapon over to the Hawkins County Sheriff's Office. Those domestic assault charges and unlawful possession of a handgun were dismissed. At a press conference yesterday, law enforcement stressed that the family is cooperating with the investigation and that while an abduction has not been ruled out, there is no evidence to support it. They're being cooperative, of course, they're upset. So we continue to keep them updated and do whatever possible we can to find Summer. And 
It's there, but you want to forget. On the watch and hypervigilant. Uh, That's how Jody Sue Brown was the very day Summer Wells went missing. There was no TV, no noise at all. Jody Sue was in her cabin with her teenage kids, 19 and 14, waiting for anything. We were kind of hyper alert um, because of property things that had happened the day before. So we were listening for noise. Everything was kind of quiet. The sale brought a plethora of people to their door, confused about which piece of land was for sale, leading to a dispute of property lines. While we were out at one point doing survey lines, and there was a flash of a car that went up Candace and Donnie's driveway, something about it struck me wrong. She and her family next heard a truck door slamming and dismissed it as their neighbors. The next sound was harder to justify. About an hour and a half before Summer is thought to go missing, Jody Sue, her son, and her daughter heard something far more suspicious, a scream. It stopped all three of us cold. Her daughter was the first to go to the cabin door. Then all three were there listening still. We heard just this kind of shrill, almost animalistic scream. Animalistic, but not an animal. Knew it was, you know, wrong. It wasn't a dog, it wasn't an animal. That vigilance kicking into overdrive. Jody Sue and her son went out to look for the source of the scream. My son and I decided to go out, look and see what we could see. We went back onto the bank, didn't see anything, didn't hear anything. They went on with their evening. The kids returned to being kids. Jody Sue headed down her driveway around six to tend to flowers. And at this point, I start hearing Candace hollering for summer. And then my brain immediately went, you know, scream earlier, this, uh-oh. Jody Sue was the first to hear those calls and the first to join the search for summer. I dropped my purse. I tried to yell up at Candace. I was like, you know, I'm looking, and I started looking. Jody Sue searched one side of a creek, Summer's brothers the opposite side. Oh. And you gave statements to the police, right? Oh, absolutely. Jody Sue had been interviewed many times by investigators, bringing up the scream often. But the sheriff doesn't believe the scream is related to the disappearance of Summer Wells. She's been interviewed numerous times by not only my agency, but the TBI and the FBI. And we don't find anything with that complaint or information related to this case. Jody Sue wishes she could go back to just a short time before Summer disappeared and before the scream she believes was Summer. I wish every day that when I heard that scream I hadn't tried to dismiss it. All we can hope for is for God to produce a miracle for all, all the Christian folks around here because there's so many people praying. Authorities say Summer Wells parents have cooperated during the investigation, but according to Hawkins County court documents, this is not the first time officers were dispatched to the home on Ben Hill Road. They were there on October 14th for a domestic assault. Summer's mom, Candace Bly, told officers Donald Wells came home drunk and saw someone else in the house and believed that Bly was cheating on him. I was in Utah. So we, she was thinking one thing and I was thinking another, you know, and but once once we got to talk and figure things out, you know, we, we smoothed it all out. I mean, there was, we, it was just we weren't on the same page, a lack of communication. The following day, Bly filed an order of protection against Wells. In the order, she says Wells drinks and throws things and that he was mentally and physically abusive. She said, quote, I am afraid for my children and myself. Because we were fighting, of course, you know, people are going to tell the police whatever to, to get their way, you know. we. We've worked it out. She's apologized to me. Four days later, Bly asked for the charges to be dismissed. Wells pleaded guilty to possession of a handgun while under the influence and turned the weapon over to the sheriff's office. The domestic assault charges and unlawful possession of a handgun were dismissed. She's went to the district attorneys. She even talked to the judge and told him that she made a serious mistake and uh, and, you know, and that's the end of it. She didn't get hurt, and I never hurt nobody. After a full week of searching and still no sign of his little girl, Wells cherishes the last time he saw her. The night before, she asked me to hold her hand where she could twirl. She loved to do that, and that's the last time I really got to spend time with her. I have lost control. I've done stupid things, and for that I apologize. Confessions of a father who says he has struggled emotionally since the disappearance of his daughter. And that's not all. You know, we've had problems with threats and uh, violence and all kind of things like that. And it's been ab 
dangerous. It's clear how many think of him. It's been dangerous not only for us, but for everybody that we're involved with. Summer's older brothers were taken by Child Protective Services back in July, a deeper strain now on their parents' marriage. Me and her have had a lot of problems because of, because of this. And we're both just down and miss our kids. And don't exactly know how to deal with all that. But they stand together in what they think happened to their only daughter. Me and Candace know for a fact that Summer was abducted. We know that, uh, but... If you, can you share with me why you know for a fact or how you know? Well, the reason that I know is because I know my wife and I, I, I know what kind of emotions and the heartbreak that she's been going through. And I'd, the way everything happened when she called me. Have police given you any information on that or any anything pointing to that? Um, no. That's unheard of. Hawkins County Sheriff Ronnie Lawson says they have found no evidence Summer was abducted. Why is it our property is any different than any other property where kids be, are abducted? Why, what makes them think, oh, there's no way an abduction can happen here, but everybody where else is, is, is probable, but not this property. You know, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect on. by any means, shape, or, or thought. Never have been perfect. Never meant to try to be perfect. And I, me neither. I mean, you. I am a person just like you. Yep. Or your wife. That's or right. That person out there on that jet ski. That's right. I'm no different than anybody else. We all make mistakes. There's no question about that. No question about it. I can't even enjoy life without my kids. Help me understand what you mean by that. Like how these guys are out here having fun with their family and stuff. I can't even go in that water and pretend to even have fun because what's the point? She's not here to enjoy it with. You know I lost a son. Yeah, you were saying that. I know that whole... I know th there's a depth of pain that nobody understands until you have been in that hole, okay? And you know, I've been in this hole twice now. Help me understand that. Well, once when my mom called me and said that they couldn't find my little sister, Rosie, Okay. when she disappeared, and that was heartbreaking. But my daughter, that's twice as worse. Right. You might as well just rip my chest out, throw it out there for the fish to eat because it's worthless without her. I wonder about that water there at Warrior State Park, the temperature of that water. Now, somebody had mentioned it in a comment and that the water wouldn't have been very warm. And if you take into consideration... Uh, summer's body mass and how skinny she was, then if the water was chilly, her core temperature could go down very quickly and that would be even even worse because she hadn't really eaten. So that with her being skinny, with cold water, she might have got a chill, you know, very cold. And um, after coming out, if it wasn't as warm as Candace keeps saying that it was, she keeps on perpetuating, she keeps on repeating how hot it was. It was so hot, it was baking hot, it was very hot that day. So I opened the back door and I let her and Hunter out. Okay. And Summer's first thing is to run to the water, of course. Right. And I was like, Summer, just wait, let me get my stuff and I'll walk over there with you. And she waited for me and I don't know, Hunter went off into the woods somewhere. I don't know. Now, where was where was Summer sitting? She was sitting in the middle seat. Okay. Hunter was sitting on the end. Okay. And my mom said, hold on a minute, so we waited for my mom to get out. Okay. And Hunter, he just done disappeared into the woods. I don't know where he went. Okay, okay. And me and my mom and Summer walked over there, and we were just letting Summer play, and then Hunter eventually come back out of the woods wherever he was. Okay. And... So let's walk over there. Show me. Okay. 
And uh, I'll just follow you, okay? No. Sure. I'll, I'll follow you on which direction and everything's slow motion now. I know, I know. So, where, where, which direction does Hunter go? Uh, he went that way. He went that way. It, now, were the ki was he in a bathing suit? No, I think he just had his shorts and his shirt on. Okay, and uh, Summer, was she in her bathing suit? Yes. And how did she get in her bathing suit? Or I actually put her bathing suit on before we left home because it was really hot out that day. Okay. So it was just something small and then not so hot. Okay, okay. Because I know how she gets too hot. Okay. And how? what was the temperature that day? Give me an idea. Probably in the 80s. Okay. I don't so it, it's Tennessee warm. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it is now. And, and and are you an air-conditioned person, or in your mom's truck was the no. AC on or I all? I don't like AC. Okay, okay. So what happened? Where where do you guys go, and where's Summer going here? We, we all walk down this path, me, my mom, and Summer. All right. So all three of you together. Yeah. Now, how does mom's knee handle this hill here? Well, she uses her cane, so it's a little bit easier, and she'll hold on to my shoulder, so. Okay. She doesn't fall or nothing. So you're kind of escorting her down here. Yeah. And is Summer ahead of you or behind She's you? She's right here in front of me. Okay. You should walk me through that. Oh, we're just walking down through here. I mean, usually, like I said, we go slow because of my mom's knee. Okay. Myself. Okay. I was just standing here at the end and then, well, the water's up a lot further than it usually is. Usually it's down. You can usually see all that wood sticking up all the water. And it's kind of odd the way that she repeats it, you know? as if she regrets that that uh, it wasn't actually that hot and that the issue was that the water was cold. So that would go better together with the windows being shut, with Summer wearing a warm, warm clothing. Maybe she dressed her in clothing which was more for warmer weather and that was a mistake. Maybe she put her in to cold water, and that was a mistake. Uh, you know, maybe she wanted to. I Sometimes kids don't understand. That's what's happened to me, that they want to get into the water. They don't want to listen when you tell them no, that it's, it's not warm enough yet, but they don't understand because it seems like a beautiful day, and they might keep persisting and saying, oh, I want to go swimming and it might just have been too cold. The water might not have warmed up yet on June 15th. You know, it's not like in the middle of July or August. It's possible that that, that, that water wasn't warm enough. And that is why they had to dress her in the long pants and long jacket to warm her up. Maybe she had, you know, maybe she, she was suffering from hypothermia and so that that could be a possibility and your body will go into shock and I don't know I don't know if that's what happened but that would kind of fit together with the clothing that we see her in and so again now we have the the whole thing which we hear from Chris McDonough uh, that basically that is the location where Candace says that she sees everything in slow motion. Now, I had noticed that she does become quite um, emotional. You'll notice that towards the end of that interview, when she, Candace is standing on the other side, where we see all of the, the branches, and she's facing towards the water, and we see Chris McDonough's back, and she's staring out into the lake, and she says that everybody, like everybody hates her or, or everyone is so difficult on her. That speaks a lot. That says a lot. Nobody's perfect though, right? You no, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect by any means, shape or, or thought. Never have been perfect. Never meant to try to be perfect. And I, me neither. I mean, you. I am a person just like you. Yep. Or your wife. That's or right. That person out there on that jet ski. That's right. I'm no different than anybody else. We all make mistakes. There's no question about that. I can't even enjoy life without my kids. Help me understand what you mean by that. Like how these guys are out here having fun with their family and stuff. I can't even go in that water and pretend to even have fun because 
What's the point? She's not here to enjoy it with. You know, I lost a son. Yeah, you were saying that. I know that whole. I know th there's a depth of pain that nobody understands until you have been in that hole, okay? And... You know, I've been in this hole twice now. Help me understand that. Well, once when my mom called me and said that they couldn't find my little sister, Rosie. Okay. When she disappeared. And that was heartbreaking. But my daughter? That's twice as worse. Right. You might as well just rip my chest out, throw it out there for the fish to eat, because it's worthless without her. I try to have hope. I just... I don't know what to do. I feel like everybody is against me. You want to you want to rest for a minute. You want to take a break for a second. Yeah. yeah. Take your time. Nobody else is here. They're all gone. Everybody left. She's feeling sorry for herself, and that she says that she she's just a regular person like everyone else. And it seems like she's kind of thinking back and and thinking about maybe a mistake that she'd made and looking out at the water and she's being very real. I don't know, it just kind of fits together with the whole theory that we've all thought from the beginning that something happened there. She's been trying to deny it, you know, and even we know that Hunter, uh, he said that that did happen and um, it could be a big mistake that she made letting Summer go into the water that day. So what do you guys think about that? That is the idea that we've all had and it could have been hypothermia that she, she froze because she was so skinny and you know not having eaten enough food and she does seem like she's kind of neglected you know as far as having bumps and bruises and just being really skinny and maybe not wearing shoes and stuff like that and we didn't hear about her having any meals that day. And so, you know, that could be that could be what happened. If that is the case, we have now we still have the same characters. We have Candace, we have Dawn. Where does the responsibility fall if that is what happened? Is that Dawn's fault? Is that Candace's fault? Now this has become a lot bigger and there are people that don't believe that it's an accident. People are thinking that this was done on purpose, that it was pre-planned, that Candace was jealous of Summer, that Candace, it is. it has been said that the plan was that actually Summer was going to be given to Grandis, that Grandis would raise her. If she was going to be a girl, then she would be given to Grandis, to the grandmother, because uh, Candace didn't want a girl. That was something which was said by, we hear that in the interview with Allison and Leslie. That is where that, that piece of, I guess you could call it hearsay or rumor, but that is what they say. And they have a lot to say about uh, not approving of the what they saw from Candace, the way that Candace was treating the kids. They didn't approve of it. So they're very judgmental about her. And so I suppose that they would want to put the blame on to Candace for whatever happened to Summer. Basically, they're saying that the way that they're talking, that the blame would be Candace's. Whatever they know, that is their point of view. And so I guess it all kind of fits together. Now back to Dawn and Candace. I'm thinking that for Dawn, he wants to stay out of trouble. And he doesn't want to end up with another charge. I think that he wanted to avoid the CPS and that he was trying to stay away from them. 
He didn't want to be caught doing something or or being around, depending upon the real scenario of what happened. Who took over? You know, some people think that Don doesn't know. He doesn't know and that he's just going on and on. And I just think that that's unlikely. I mean, do you guys think that that is possible, that he doesn't know what happened? I mean, he would have he would have basically gotten that information from Candace. If she knows, then I think he knows. You know, he would have been able to find out, to figure that out. You know, but it seems like it's a lot more. It seems like he basically took over and he took control, damage control, and he he became the spokesperson. And then there's the people who actually think that uh, Candace doesn't know. So the theories have pretty much gone crazy. There's been every kind of theory and it's just to the point where you know, and so so drastically different. But the thing is that, and thank goodness, the the TBI does have a lot more information than any of us. And they have the phone calls. They can check things and verify what was said. They know what the lies are. You know, little bits of information that they get from the text messages. You know, from the locations. They can suss out and figure out little lies and those little lies will lead them to big untruths you know things uh, which will show deception and then you've got to ask why and so I'm thinking that they know a lot more which which we don't know and hopefully somebody will will make you know make a call and an anonymous call somehow let that information leak out, you know, a little hint for the TBI that they can find Summer, you know, and if this was, let's say it was a scenario where she's still alive, then, and there are cases like that, there's lots of cases where there, where a child is abducted and they're found, let's say, 15 years later or 20 years later, someone can can give that clue. Someone can make that call and say, okay, I saw a child, I have, let's say, a relative, and they were behaving strangely, and then I saw that they had a child. And it could be in, it could be in a state like on the other side of, of the country. You know, it could be at the opposite end, westbound or, or to the east, to the extreme, you know, far away. And so that person might not be aware of the Summer Wells case. And that is very possible because if you see the coverage that the case gets, or even if you look at the views, it, they, it, she doesn't get very many views into the hundreds of thousands. It's more like an average, I, I'd say, let's say, maybe 30,000 or 40,000, but it's not like, for example, like the Gabby Petito case, where you see hundreds of thousands of people uh, getting the coverage. So the point is that, you know, there's a lot of people that don't know, that don't know this, her face. They don't know that this beautiful child is missing. They simply don't know. And they are not, basically they're not, um, getting it, let's say, even on YouTube. They're not getting it on their page. So it's not really being seen unless it's covered by, for example, if it was covered by another state or a bigger broadcast, then, you know, the Dr. Phil show is good because then every person that has cable will then be aware of it. Anyway, so hopefully they will find Summer soon. And I think this is just one of those tragic cases. It is a tragedy and it's, it's kind of like a, it's a huge, I guess, it's, it's very sad. And regardless of what the reason is, why it happened, I think it's really sad because when you see, uh, you know, not only because she's a beautiful child, but the whole scenario, the whole, the way that they, they were living in a dangerous situation. You know, they couldn't handle the, the, the situation they were in. The CPS calls, those were warning signs. It was, unfortunately, 
um, it looks like CPS was a bit late because if if they had, for example, if they had taken Summer, then maybe Summer would be alive now. Maybe there would be some kind of, let's say, they could get their act together. They could get some help. Maybe Candace could have gotten some help. And, you know, that would have been good for Summer and for the boys before things had gone gotten to that point where Summer went missing and where the boys were taken away. But then I, I think like in the scenario that I see, I see this as an accident. I see this as like as a dry drowning kind of thing or as hypothermia. And in that case, depending upon, you know, if they were even there, if the mother had walked away and wasn't even watching, that makes it worse. Let me know what you guys think about that. There is some question of whether or not the grandmother left the car, if she was sitting in the car. So there's no lack of, um, I guess you could say, drama or crazy stories. And, you know, a lot of it doesn't really have to do with Summer's disappearance, but it kind of has to do with Summer's life. It has to do with the life that Summer was living, her daily life, you know, her family kind of life that she was living and the situations that were happening on a day-to-day basis. If she is living with parents that are having issues with substance abuse, whether that's you hear about, let's say, some people have issues with alcohol and that is very difficult for children of those people to deal with because you, when you have a parent who is abusing alcohol, then that child will have to compensate when they find their parent is under, is basically using whatever it is, and they're under the influence, and they can't, they can't really um, be responsible for the child and care for the child, and let's say make the child a meal, keep the house clean for the child, shop for food, um, anything like they can't eventually even pay for heating or whatever, uh, electricity, and then the child will suffer. And the child will have to compensate um, instead of having help from the parent, for example, for school, for clothing, for whatever it is, then they will have to help the parent. Uh, When they see that their parent is ill, they'll end up having to care for that parent and not only care for the parent, but they will then care for themselves. The child will end up caring for themselves and caring for their parent. And they are not equipped to do that at that age. They can't do that. And then they are also put into dangerous situations. So a lot of the times there's, in these stories that you hear about, then you might see that there is abuse. When people are drinking, they might put the child into a dangerous situation where one or both of the parents, or even it could be that a parent is dating, and the person that they're dating might have an issue with, let's say, drinking or whatever, and then the child is put into danger because they're living with that parent. And so I guess that is more a reflection of the danger that the child is facing. And in this case, we'll find out eventually possibly, but it's possible that Summer was living like in danger. And that is what we hear about from Allison and Leslie, that especially Leslie, she didn't approve of what she saw and uh, she didn't want to be around Candace. She didn't like what she saw, the way that the kids were being treated. And, you know, that is a very straightforward, the way that she says it. So she did point out, she did talk about one incident that we all heard from the beginning that the boys were forced to lay on a hot black pavement on their stomachs coming out of a pool. That was their punishment. And so that was just one thing that she did tell, but she said that she didn't like, you know, there was more. There was more to it. And they refer to all of the CPS calls, that there were many, many, many CPS calls. So it's kind of mind-boggling if you think, like, 
how could there be so many CPS calls and it like nothing was done? And they say that uh, basically that when CPS would go to the house, the doors would be locked and nobody, they wouldn't open the door. That is what they said. So I guess that is a way of kind of getting away with things. And so it's too bad that summer wasn't saved in, in time. That maybe she would still be alive. And that maybe she would still be well. And maybe even, you know, even her mother could have gotten help. If it, it's true that she did uh, complain that Dawn was, you know, abusing her. She did make that complaint. And then he says, oh, that she said it wasn't true and, you know, everything's fine now. You know, I doubt that because it, the truth is that in these cases, those abusers, that is what they end up doing and saying. You know, they make the, the victim recount their story and then they pay for it. The victim will then pay for it and they will then say, oh, it wasn't true just the way he did, you know. And so she might be like an abused woman. It, that, that might very well be the case. And so it's, it's very sad. And anyways, let me know what you guys think about it, how you see this whole thing. But I hope that somebody will make that call. And I think that there's a couple people that, that have the power to do that, to make a call and give that hint. You know, tell, tell the authorities somehow somehow reach out anonymously so that the authorities can find summer and they can you know give her a little bit of give her something give her give her some kind of a ceremony you know some form of love and respect to show that that you did care for her and she deserves that she deserves you know some kind of of an ending that can just respect her you know and and I don't know I don't know if it's gonna happen but I hope I hope it happens so thank you guys so much for joining me today I look forward to reading your comments and let's keep our fingers crossed maybe there'll be a break in this case and uh, maybe they'll find summer soon hopefully so that is it for now I want to thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.